So, um, so today I have the privilege of talking about some uh, letters that were written by this gentleman, uh, Paul Rummel. Um, okay, wrong. okay, there you go. Uh, descendants of, uh, of, of Mr. Remmel donated a couple of, uh, of letters that he wrote during his service in World War I to the Old State House Museum. And, uh, and I, I know we have some Remmels. Uh, any, any, uh, anybody who's related to Paul Remmel, please raise your hand. Okay, very good, very good. Glad you all can make it, and thank you for donating these, uh, these incredible letters to the, to the museum. It's great to, great to work with them. Um, Okay, now I have uh, annotated these letters and they will be published in the next issue of the Arkansas Historical Quarterly with the, you know, Bomb Tehran is not a current event. This, that article's about the, uh, the, the, the Iranian crisis back in the, back in the 80s. Now, uh, 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 any, who in here is a member of the Arkansas Historical Association? Okay, very good. Now, the, the rest of you should all be ashamed of yourselves. It's only $20 a year. You get four issues of the Arkansas Historical Quarterly, and if you uh, go to their website and, and join now, you'll, you'll be uh, signed up in time to get this, uh, this very issue when it comes out, it comes out next month. Okay. okay. So, um, Paul Remmel was born on, uh, in 1891 near, uh, near, near Newport. Uh, his, his parents had uh, uh, eight children, of which he was the sixth, and I guess that was a lot of, a lot of kids to keep up with, and, and uh, 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 Mrs., Mrs. Hirsch asked her sister, uh, Laura Lee Stafford uh, Remmel, if she would raise Paul, and she and her husband, uh, uh, Harmon, Harmon Livright, Livright Remmel, to, uh, to uh, uh, basically adopt him, which they did, and, and uh, young Paul took the Remmel name, he graduated from Little Rock High School in 1910, uh, published or, or attended the University of Illinois for a couple of years, and then he uh, went to work for, uh, for, for his uh, uncle Harmon at the Bankers Trust Office, which had uh, offices in the Gazette Building, which that will be relevant here in, uh, in just, uh, just a moment. Um, so when, when World War I broke out, when, we, when, when the U.S. entered World War I in April of 1917, uh, young Paul was was ready to serve. He was one of the first 19 uh, youths in, in Arkansas to sign up for uh, a, a, a course at uh, Fort Roots in North Little Rock. Um, he was inducted in the Army on August 15, 1917 as a first lieutenant. Now while he was at Fort Roots, uh, okay, the, the Gazette during, the, uh, during World, War, uh, World War I had a, a special section called the Fort Roots Gazette that, that ran, I think it was on page, page two or three of the, the A section every, uh, every day. And, uh, and uh, Paul Remmel shows up a lot in that. He organized a lot of social activities. He was very, very active on the base. And, uh, um, and that, you know, that I think is something of a measure of the, of the man right there. Uh, he he uh, shipped to France by October of 1917 where he served in Company G of the 16th Infantry Regiment in the 1st Infantry Division, the, first bi the Big Red 1. And there's a, uh, another photo, that's Paul on the, uh, Paul on the, the, the left, uh, that's his uncle uh, Harmon, and I believe that's Harmon Jr. who he's holding in his, uh, in his arms there. And the other three guys are some of his, uh, Paul's colleagues from, uh, from, from Fort Roots. Now he wrote a lot of letters home, uh, and and a lot of those letters uh, his uncle would would have published in the Arkansas Gazette. And I'll point out Mike Polston back here. He's uh, Mike is running the uh, Arkansas World War One Letters Project, where people are transcribing these Doughboy letters that were published during the war, and uh, um, they're, they're um, uh, he's putting them online, including a lot of them from uh, from from Paul Remmel, uh, Carolyn Kent. Uh, did a uh, an article on those those uh, Harmon or those Paul Remmel letters in a recent issue of the uh, Pulaski County Historical Quarterly, but I think uh, I think it was the graphic uh, uh, content of these two letters that probably led uh, Harmon to not submit them for publication in in the Gazette. So before we get into the main topic of the letters, uh, there was an aside at the end of the first letter that I, I thought was kind of was really quite interesting. 
and it's significant because, he, uh, because of his office in the uh, Gazette building, where, when the Gazette, of course, was run by the High School Brothers. So he wrote, tell Fred High School that the last time I was in Paris, while sipping a most refreshing drink at the Café de la Pas, I met a person who, upon finding that I was from Arkansas, asked about him. He was an English officer, or had anyway the tunic of one. He was sitting at an adjoining table and started out by asking me where I was from. I told him I was from, uh, 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 I told him he was, I told him and he was an American from New York and had been be given a complimentary commission in the uh, English Army. We had quite a conversation between drinks and he showed me many pictures of himself taken at the, uh, at the British front. I noticed he had an English motor or car uh, waiting for him with which he told me he toured the various fronts. I then asked him what sort of a pass he had and added that I would like to secure one like it. He pulled it out and showed it to me. It was signed by the British government and made out to Mr. Bud Fisher. After coming to the name, I asked him if he was the father of Mutt and Jeff, and he was. After that, we had a few more drinks, and Mutt and Jeff was a, an extremely popular uh, uh, comic strip for many, many years. And I was told this is the first time that Mutt and Jeff has been a, a footnote in the Arkansas Historical Quarterly, so thank, thank you for that. So, uh, so these, uh, um, these letters deal with Paul's service during the Meuse-Argonne campaign in uh, uh, September to November of 1918. Uh, the offensive began with an intense artillery barrage on September 29, 1918. The 16th Infantry Regiment was hit on the morning of October 1 with a barrage of mustard and phosgene gas shells that caused 70 casualties in the unit. Over the next four days, 3,470 gas shells would strike the first, first, first division positions, inflicting more than 900 casualties. Lieutenant Colonel Edward R. Coppock led the 2nd and 3rd Battalions of the 16th forward on October 4, and they were immediately met with heavy machine gun fire. They ultimately dug in on a ridge south of Flavel, having established a salient into German lines that left them surrounded on three sides. The regiment had gone over the top with 20 officers and 800 men. Two officers and 240 men remained at the end of the day. The 2nd and 3rd Battalions held their position for the next several days, undergoing relentless machine gun, artillery, and gas attacks. The 1st Battalion of the 16th Infantry was placed with the 18th Infantry as part of the Division Reserve when they attacked Hill 272 on the morning of October 9 in a heavy fog. The battalion took the hill by 11 a.m. Anticipating a push forward the next morning, Coppock went to the rear to seek volunteers to bolster the ranks of his ravaged regiment, recruiting several cooks, mule drivers, and others to join the frontline infantry. The three battalions of the 16th Infantry advanced early on October 10 and found resistant light as German defenders fell back, offering little resistance. Coppock turned the lines held by the 2nd and 3rd Battalion over to relief troops that afternoon, and the 1st Battalion was relieved by the 42nd Division the next day. The 16th fell back to Varennes to rest and recuperate. So that's kind of the context in which these, uh, these letters were, uh, were written. So from here on, it's all Paul. I am writing this flat on my stomach in a, tiny little, in a tiny little foxhole which I am sharing with one of my corporals. A succession of foxholes which form our front line trench, which is four kilometers long, our division front. The Bosch are 400 yards from us, and at this moment, they are sprinkling us with machine gun fire and villainous artillery, a fire which has been going on for five days. We are occupying a hill which my regiment wrested from the Germans the day before I joined my old company. We are on the best side of the hill, and 15 yards ahead of us, our machine guns are stationed, and they keep the Bosch pretty well down. In our company front, we had six men who had been lying dead for three days, and I suggested to the captain that they be buried. He, re he replied that it was a very good idea. Death means li so little here. Being wounded is the way out. I am getting so I just cord a good convenient shrapnel wound in the back. It's a lifesaver, I tell you. The dead boys were lying just where they had fallen with their guns in their hands, but with terrible wounds. One little blue-eyed fella had a sort of self-satisfied smile on his face. He was right, they are all heroes. I went through them collecting their letters, watches, and money, and identification discs to send to the, to the rear. We dug a row of, of uh, neat little graves just under a plum tree, and we marked them with rudely made crosses. Just before we collected the bodies, I asked a machine gunner who was kneeling by his gun if there were any dead men around him. 
He replied by pointing to another hole right by him. Sure enough, we found a poor fellow all doubled up, covered with blood and dead. The machine gunner then said there was another one just behind him in another hole who needed to be buried and was, uh, who was covered by an old shelter half. While I was pointing out the place to my chief digger, I was surprised to see the dead one rise up to a sitting position and hear him say, I'll be damned if I do, not now. <laughs> Evidently, the machine gunner had been mistaken. My tin hat, my gun, and gas mask at the alert is my costume. Haven't shaved nor washed for a week. Little things like washing one teeth or lost arts out here, between Verdun and Reims. We haven't had time for that out here. The Bosch are putting up a terrible resistance. We do not even know what day this is. And to re in reply to a question of what day this is, a healthy buck private who is a patron of a foxhole on my left, sa my left said that he thought it was Sunday for his cooties, were all, his cooties always itched on that day. <laughs> Seriously, it's between the 4th and 10th of October. And now we get to the meat of the letters. Six days later, October 14, 1918. Since my last letter, I have experienced the horrors of war, the advancing to the attack, digging in under terrific shell fire, seen men fall and left and right and left horribly mutilated by the high explosive shell fire. It is over now for after eight days in the line, eight for me, 12 for my regiment. We, the first division, the wonderful division that has been in every attack except one has been relieved. You can't imagine, you who are miles from this red bloody hell that makes up war, what one word relief means. Paul's men moved forward on the attack. In my company G, there were only two uh, officers, myself and my captain, so I was in command of half of the company and had the wonderful opportunity of advancing ahead of the captain in his wave. After three quarters of an hour walk, we placed our companies in the woods and prepared to spend the night. Evidently, the Bosch knew that. Some troops were coming up. For the, for the minute we arrived, the shelling began. It's an ungodly noise. You feel so helpless when the high explosive breaks, scattering bits of shrapnel all over. The heavy shells blind and deafen one, and when they're hit, huge trees are uprooted and holes are made, which are amply large for a two-story house. It's terrible. In spite of the, th of the thick darkness in the woods and spurred on by the terrible art artillery fire, our battalion found tiny dugouts which had been constructed by the Bosch before they were forced to retire by the oncoming Yanks. The Bosch have the knack for building dugouts, sides reinforced by entwining branches of trees and roofed over by heavy limbs and a heavy coating of earth over all. I slept in a tiny dugout with one of my sergeants and my orderly five feet below the ground. Not very deep, but deep enough for one night. Under there, we could feel the concussion and the, ring of the, uh, uh, and the ring as the huge shells came ringing over and burst with diabolical force. We did not get much sleep that night, for it was beastly cold, and everyone was uneasy, for we all knew we were going forward the first thing in the morning. The huge shells burst around, all around us, and every minute we expected to be our last. I was almost scared to death, and I firmly believe I have aged greatly, for a huge shell burst just 10 feet from us, burying us almost completely with dirt. We dug ourselves out, and after feeling ourselves all over and learning that all of our members were still attached to our bodies, we felt better. Just three minutes after, I noticed two boys limping, helping each other hobble to the rear in search of a hospital man, and between the, uh, the screams of the shells, I heard my captain tell them to get down, but they paid no attention or did not hear, for they hobbled on on their way to the rear. And then a huge shell burst directly over them, and they were literally scattered. It was awful. One boy had his head nearly blown off, the other his right side completely carried away. It is strange the horror of it all does not dawn on you, for at such a time you are on such a terrific strain. You are temporarily insane. I guess to see men drop on either side of you while you are going forward, to pass dead men blown to pieces, bodies here, legs and boots there, dead bosh here and there, makes no impression upon you at the time. Your mind is intent upon your escape from the screeching, howling shells and the swish and sing-song of the machine gun bullets. But when it is all over, comes up like a, but when, this is, when it is all over, it all comes back up like a horrible and loathsome nightmare. And when you get back to where we are now and talk about it, you can hardly believe it was real. In the midst of this terrible din, a runner came crawling on his belly to my trench with the order from the captain that I should move forward at once with my wave keeping 300 yard intervals between, my, between the attacking battalion. I gave the signal to my 60 men and uh, simultaneously they hopped out of their holes and then like a lo loud clap of thunder something burst 
what seemed to be directly over my head, blinding and deafening me. At the same time, I felt a thousand needle points in my face and shoulders and one, strong, one stronger prick in my left ear. I found myself on my knees and in my mind's eye, I saw myself on a little white cot in, a, uh, in, in, a, in some hospital while a good looking nurse fed me eggnog. And I was secretly glad for I thought uh, it would keep me out for at least two months. Imagine my disgust when I found my head was still on, my shoulder not even wounded, and a tiny stream of blood trickling from my left ear. A huge shell burst 10 feet above me, showering me with tiny particles of shrapnel. The larger pieces had passed me up, completely ignoring my existence, but a tiny piece had caught me in the left ear. My, I was proud when I felt that thin line of blood on my face. All this time, about 30 seconds, and then I was on my feet again in front of my men who advanced steadily in spite, in spite of the strafing. As we advanced, it became more evident that the attacking battalion did not, uh, oh boy, I'm sorry, I missed a couple of. Oh. Oh, uh, okay. Technology. Okay, yeah, there's the, that, the shells. Okay. All this took about 30 seconds, and then I was on my feet again in front of my men who advanced steadily in spite of the strafing. As we advanced, it became more evident that the attacking battalion did not need our help by the silent evidence lying on the ground in all sorts of shapes. We knew they were reaching their objective and doing a thorough job of it. As we passed on our way, we saw hundreds of German machine guns and, and gunners caught at their post. Looking out from the edge of our woods onto an open space, we could see the ground covered with dead and wounded, and Bosch prisoners filed, es filed past, escorted by a guard going to the rear, while in the distance, the dying battle could be heard, the victorious attacking battalion still on its way. We occupied the trenches of the Bosch, and after posting guards and sending out patrols, settled for the night while, uh, while flares sent up by the retreating Huns showed us plainly the battlefield now just in front of us, and such a field, dead, dead and dead. Now and then we could hear the agonizing call for help from several wounded out in front, just 100 yards from me. I sent out a small detail to hunt for them and find the poor fellows, our men, who were in a bad way and sent them to the rear. The field covered with dead, plowed up by huge shell holes, with machine guns and mutilated humans illuminated by those white flares showing blown wire and scattered material together with those cries for help voiced in that uncanny place are things I shall carry with me for the rest of my days. Word came about 10 o'clock that the attacking battalion of our regiment had reached its final objective, and so we were ordered back to our hill from where I wrote my other letter. We were mighty light-hearted, I can assure you, and slept of the fact wonderfully well in spite of the fact that all of us were tired and had not washed nor had our boots off for 12 days, eight for me. You ought to have seen my beard, it was long enough to plate. The next night we were relieved and at last and filed out and after dusk but before officers from the incoming division came in to make reconnaissance once and we were mighty glad to turn the sector over to them with the hope that they would do just half as well as we did. And when the roar of the guns grew fainter and fainter the spirits of our boys grew lighter and lighter and they talked among themselves of red wine and other pleasures which they had been long deprived of. And that concludes the letter. There was a postscript where he said, and I'm enclosing a document which explains itself, which unfortunately was not uh, part of it. Uh, also an iron cross ribbon that I took from a dead Bosch's coat and his picture. So this is a German casualty of the, uh, the attack that in which this um, the, the company G was involved. And this is from the, uh, this is from the report of the, uh, the chaplain of the 16th Regiment, of the 62 officers and around 2,700 men who went into, ba into action. Seven officers and 129 men were killed. 23 officers and 812 men were wounded. Four officers and 298 men were gassed. One officer and 361 men were, were missing. Um, this pretty high percentage of casualties for the, for the 16th Regiment. But Paul Remmel lived to be 100. He uh, mustered out on August 29, 1919, married Mar Margaret Ledgwick in 1921, and had a son, Paul Jr., and a daughter, Margaret. He worked as an insurance salesman and a real estate broker and was active in the Republican Party, as his, uh, his uncle had been. 
He lived to be 100, dying on September 14, 1991, and he's buried in Calvary Cemetery here in, uh, here in Little Rock. And that uh, house there, that is 12 Alpine Court. That's where, uh, that's where Paul lived and raised his family. So before I take questions, I did want to mention um, the, the, uh, the final activity of the World War I Committee is going to be on November 11 at 11 o'clock. Uh, we're asking uh, people and groups all over the state to ring a bell, to ring a bell 11 times to, com to, to celebrate the end of the Great War, which ended at 11 on 11-11 in 1918. So, and uh, with that, I will be happy to answer any questions that I can.